So let's get started. We've known what the title of the talk is. So I thought the first slide would be a bit of a puzzle. Um, so I've got three images on the slide. There is a connection. Um, so the first one is a skeleton of a T-Rex. The second image is the glacial advancement. And the third image is um, an image of a runner running. Um, and it's specifically looking at the, the gait of the runner. So I'm not going to throw it out to the audience at this point, but the connection with these three kind of um, images is the research that underpins them. So there was a piece of games technology that was used in the research um, associated with these three pictures that was a motion sensor. So the traditional or the um, intended use of that game technology was as a motion sensor. So it would provide some gestural input into um, a game, for example. But it has been repurposed and been used in a whole bunch of different scientific applications. So there was a recent paper in Nature that talked about the research hardware in your video game system. So that's anything from a, a PlayStation 4 through to an Xbox. And the Connect motion sensor, because it was kitted with pretty sophisticated instrumentation, was repurposed um, for a lot of different scientific research. So the example that I have there is a, a dinosaur fossil that's in the Fields Museum in Chicago. And because the Connect has um, two cameras and a depth, is basically a depth sensor with an infrared um, instrument, the um, researchers strapped the Connect um, to the chest and did a 360 walk around of that skull. And what they were able to get from that was a pretty much a cheap way to generate a 3D model of that um, skull. So what was interesting from the scientific perspective, I think you could maybe just see um, here, are some of the holes in this skull. So a forensic dentist thought that that was some kind of bite mark. So they wanted the 3D model so they could do some additional analysis. So the Kinect was known to be, I guess, a, a cheaper piece of games technology that could be um, repurposed for a whole um, different um, set of applications other than games, which was its intended purpose. So just to set the scene, because we might not all know what I mean by games technology, is the it kind of ranges from the hardware, so from the actual console itself, so the PlayStation or the Xbox, through to the software that we use to, to make games or design games or interactive experiences. So we've got some images there of some AR, VR technology. Um, so we've got the HoloLens, so augmented reality, through to controllers that control the game, um, the Kinect, which is the motion sensor, um, the GPUs, so this is a piece of hardware that drives the graphics for, of games and some of the computation through to some of the software. So the software, um, we have game engines that can make games or um, interactive experiences through to low level programming um, languages that we can use um, to create interactive applications. So I thought it would be useful just to represent my journey um, from physics to games technology um, and how, in a sense, everything is linked. So when I was in fourth year up at Dundee University um, studying um, physics, I was introduced to this textbook um, called New Physics by Paul Davies. And what I was very, what captured my imagination was the concept of emergent self-organization. And I guess I probably, um, these captured my imagination because they were things that you can observe around you. So from the flocking of birds through to some of the patterns that we observe in nature, they could be described by fairly simple processes or models. Um, and so when I came to Aberdeen, I embarked on a PhD, and I will tell you a little bit about some of the stuff that I studied. But it was really using some of these concepts from um, self-organization and emergence to develop a theory for uh, microbial systems um, that was a bit different from the existing theories, and then linking that theory to experimentation. So whenever we're trying to understand a system, a model is good, but it's always good to try and get some data to verify your model. So it was the systems approach kind of incorporated simulation and experimentation. 
And whilst I was looking at the, the systems approach, it was obvious that it was a lack of visualization tools that would allow me to uncover the, the complexities or the stories that were in the data. So I guess this was my first, or the initiation into games technology. So this was back in 2005, so seems quite a long time ago now. But I used um, some of the APIs that are used for games to develop interactive visualizations of the systems that I was um, working with. Um, so I guess the characteristic of these systems that I was working with is that they're um, three, 3D, so they, they vary in space and time, but they're also multidimensional and multivariate. So for these systems, there was n wasn't really any software package that I could use off the shelf that would allow me to investigate and explore. Um, so I guess that is my hook into games technology. So I developed my skill set around my key well, core areas, which is simulation and visualization using the games technology. And I would classify myself as an interdisciplinary researcher. So um, I very much work with different groups and I like working on different problems. Um, so I think the characteristics of games technologies that is appealing to um, other areas and other um, simulation visualization um, problems are customization. So with a, a games engine or a, ga a graphics API, you as the programmer can decide how you want to display your data. Okay, you're not constrained by the, the functionality that's offered by the software. Um, and I think that is visually, but also you can make use of sound. Um, the other characteristic is the, the interactivity. So most all games, they're not passive um, artifacts. You interact with games. So you can make use of that interactivity to unpack the complexity, explore your data um, that you have from your simulation or um, and, out, and models. And I think the other area that's maybe under um, utilised in scientific visualisation is around aesthetics and design. So we know you see good design um, and it's actually capturing some of those elements and translating them into scientific visualisations. And the last point or characteristics of the advantages of game tech is around optimization. So you can use the hardware much like that motion sensor but this time being the graphics card to accelerate your graphics or your simulation, okay? So um, games technology, I think, can, can make a big difference to a lot of um, simulation and visualization in a lot of different application areas. And you'll see as we go through this presentation um, some of the application areas that we have worked on. So games technology, this kind of sets out the um, parts of the talk. So we've got games technology and what we've talked about is that broader um, spectrum of games tech. What my focus really is on is the use of GPU to accelerate rendering and simulation. Um, so the areas that I've worked predominantly in is the simulation and interactive visualization, um, an area that is of interest and I'll talk about um, state of the art is in um, AI. Um, and as I, ex I guess, show some of the um, visualizations in practice, you'll see that they're quite, some of them are dated and some of them are modern. And that just really shows the journey. And I thought it was useful to, to, to show how the, the graphics have become more um, sophisticated as the, the hardware has evolved. So the application areas are around complex systems, uh, modeling, environmental planning, um, service provision and fundamental science and the interactive visualization really speaks to the public policy makers, researchers, charities and business. So these are all the stakeholders that I've engaged with uh, um, the course of my career um, so far. So the first part then is around games tech and simulation. So using the graphics card to make our um, models run faster. So the graphics, GPUs or graphical processing units are part of, uh, within a PC, you have CPU and the GPU. Traditionally, GPUs were used for rendering only. 
and the video game industry drove the evolution of the hardware architecture um, and GPU capabilities. So if I just run this little um, animation, you'll actually see how the graphics cards have evolved. So first of all, you'll see that the size, the spatial footprint um, increases, but also you'll see that there's a, the fan to dissipate the heat that's generated because the GPU is working pretty hard. A lot of maths calculation gets bigger as well. Um, so you see over time, the GPU is much bigger. So traditionally, as I said, the, the graphics card was pretty much um, used to turn a 3D scene, so where you've got some kind of geometry, so pyramids, spheres, um, cylinders, and you want to translate that into a 2D image, a raster, with the correct um, the objects in the correct location and shading. Um, and major, I guess, breakthroughs in terms of the um, GPU evolution were what's called the programmable pipeline, um, compute functionality and the increased um, precision of floating point operations. So what that, I guess, permitted was the use of GPUs, not just as uh, for rendering, but for um, general purpose um, computing. So the pro programmable pipeline element is important because then it meant that, that you, as a programmer, could write your own code to say how you wanted your data to be displayed. Okay, so it gave you that flexibility. The compute functionality then meant that rather than trying to um, input your data that you wanted um, for, to run some simulation as part of uh, the rendering pipeline, so through via textures or vertex buffers, you could actually just specify the, um, the model that, or that you wanted to run in a compute shader. And the last point is really important for scientific um, simulation. So generally, the GPUs wouldn't have been used because in games, um, accuracy is not you know, the, the, the end point. It just has to be good enough in a game. But for um, any science simulation, it has to be accurate. So when um, GPUs supported um, better precision, then it allowed then the GPUs to be used for scientific um, simulation. So what that is called when we port our models from the CPU to the GPU is called hardware acceleration. So we're using the GPU, which is a piece of hardware to accelerate the computation, and it's generally known as GPGPU. So then GPUs are parallel computers and they're better than CPUs for some tasks, but not all. So it's important to know what um, criteria or what problems are good to port to the GPU. And it's this notion, if you were to, to have, I should have maybe had an image of a CPU and a GPU, a CPU at most has maybe 10 cores, yeah, whereas a, a GPU has thousands of cores. So in essence, you've got much more um, horsepower in your GPU, but only for simpler tasks, okay? If your problem has lots of branching, then it's probably not a good thing for your GPU, but if it's, um, straightforward calculations like a lot of matrix algebra that is needed when you're transforming your vertexes from one um, space to the next, then it's ideal for the GPU. So GPUs are now used for more than rendering. So they're really used for computation as well as, um, and that includes AI problems and ray tracing. And we'll pick up on some of these points later, so I'm not going to dwell on that. But the main advantage, I guess, then, of hardware acceleration is performance. It's going to make your um, simulations mu run much faster. Um, and I guess one of the other advantages around the availability of um, tools that allow you to write code for your GPU. So before that was a problem, um, whereas now, there's a bunch of tools that allow um, people with some programming skills, you know, to port code to the GPU. So the limitations then of um, GPU computation is that you have to transfer your data from the CPU to the GPU somehow. Okay, and that's costly. So you want to, to avoid the number of times that you do that. And as I've touched upon, not all problems are suitable for the GPU. So there was some work that came out of Berkeley that looked at patterns of computation for parallelization, and they came up with seven patterns at first. And so these were called um, the seven dwarfs. But then, through research, this has extended to 13 different patterns of computation. So whenever you're parallelizing um, your, your algorithm, it's good to refer to some of these um, 
problem spaces to see what is good practice in terms of um, a good design. And the other limitation is around the learning curve for some of the tools that allow us to program for the GPU. So in the past, the learning curve was, was high, uh, whereas now, with the release of tools like OpenAC, the um, actually parallelizing the code is can be straightforward. So I wanted just to give an example of, of um, where we have accelerated some of the, the simulations or the models using GPU. And the first one was just around a, a, the hello world of reaction diffusion systems, which is the Gray-Scott equations. And essentially what this recovers or what this um, system does is creates the enormous um, variety of patterns that you can see in nature. So the Turing patterns have been used to um, create textures, for, for example, for um, animal patterns and such like seashells, as you could see there. So it's got widespread applications in ecology, biology, um, computer graphics and visual arts. And so we parallelized this and optimized it via um, the GPU. And we used one of these higher level um, frameworks called OpenAC. And this is descriptive and directive based. So what it means for those that are programmers in the room, wherever you've got nested loops, you just basically annotate the code to say parallelize this. Then the compiler will decide what to do and how to do it and um, offload those computations to the GPU. So it's very simple to get started with um, initially. So it's got this flexible mapping of algorithmic parallelism to the available hardware resources, and the compiler takes care of that. So essentially what we get, if we were to um, parallelize this using the CPU, we'd probably only have like 10 threads, whereas we can have thousands of threads, and threads are the unit of work. So our algorithm is then, is then um, sent out basically to work across or distribute across all these threads. And we can make use of some of the properties of the GPU such as shared memory. So what we found is, yeah, we did get speed ups, but we had to be careful about the um, data management, so the transfer of the CPU, the data from the CPU to the GPU. So this is the only equations I have in this slide, in this presentation you'll be thankful for. Um, and what you see here is just the animations of different initial conditions or different parameters about how these two um, chemicals um, change over space and time in the system. So that kind of was a nice lead on to some of the work that I did when I was in my PhD and the development of um, my own visualization tools. And the focus of the PhD was to look at well, actually, it was a, to use these reaction diffusion systems, but not to model patterns, but to try and understand the, the biology um, of um, fungal colonies growing in their natural environment. So what's challenging with um, fungi as microbes is they lack a general theory compared to plants and um, bacteria. Um, and that's partly because of their complex structure. So most people, when you think of fungi, think of mushrooms, but what actually is much more interesting is the expansive network that grows underground. Um, and this basically doesn't have any characteristic length or time scale. So um, fungi can potentially exist forever if there was enough resources there. So this is challenging from a modeling perspective um, to capture what are the key um, biological processes um, that you know, recover what we see in nature. So some of the, the, the work kind of speaks to those previous um, simulation outputs where we were just recovering um, the, the growth and dynamics of, of um, microbes on agar plates, which is all very interesting, but it's you know, not very realistic. So then there's a, a move to look at more um, realistic environments. So in terms of novelties from the, the PhD work, it was really about the refinement of the key biological processes. So many of the theories or models that existed of this microbial um, growth didn't include um, a biomass recycling component, which is pretty much cru crucial for survival in a heterogeneous environment in which most of these microbes live. Um, and so this was... a general model of filamentous fungal growth. So you can replicate the different patterns of different species of, of microbes by changing the parameters that controlled the, the reaction diffusion system. And so we, I guess this just shows some of the um, 
the extension of that model to look at interactions in space between individuals and then how we used some of the visualisation tools to try and um, see, you know, simultaneously the, the environment in which these um, organisms were growing in, but also um, the individuals themselves. And obviously these ran over time, so you're able to check the, the evolution. Um, and sometimes it was useful for debugging and also sometimes it was useful just to to understand the system that we were trying to, to model. And then this is a really, really retro graphic. So this was developed using DirectX 9, um, 2007, 2008. Um, and it showed the, the, the quality of the visuals that we were able to achieve there. But it was still useful, it still served its purpose, because what I was interested in is how these different organisms, it's a bit like um, space wars, were filling space and competing with one another. But I guess it just shows in this slide here to demonstrate that the, the visualization tools at the time were lacking. So um, drawing on, I guess, the teaching that was going on here in terms of the, the, the games courses was useful then to feed that into our research. So we applied this um, model to look at a more um, realistic um, example. And it's about round about how um, carbon is broken down and so how that impacts on the sea cycle, the carbon cycle. Um, so we had the physical representation of space and then we were able to model the water distribution through Lattice Boltzmann modeling. We were able to run different scenarios related to where the carbon was in the system and then see how that impacted or affected the respiration of the, the microorganisms. And so I guess the motivation behind that kind of modeling was testing the um, relevance of the microscale features in models. So generally, they weren't really included. So we were trying to um, demonstrate the importance of the microscale features and also test the assumptions of linearity. So in a lot of the, the larger scale carbon models, there's an assumption that more CO2 will be produced as there's more um, soil organic carbon. And that's not necessarily the case because the microbes in the soil structure regulate that release of CO2. So it was those, um, we, were we were gathering data to um, test some of those assumptions. So this work's led on to some work um, in col collaboration with Wilfred at, at, um, with Cranfield University, looking at that system and trying to find out what factors have critical tipping points beyond which the, um, some of the ecosystem services will diminish. And so it's got a high, high performance computing angle, which I'll talk a bit about. Um, and so that project's recently finished, but has led on to another investment from NERC that's looking at quantifying the relationship between biodiversity and ecosystem processes and functions. So what that generally means is that we need high performance computing to tackle some of these questions because we need to simulate enough replicates so that we can draw reliable conclusions. Um, and that generally means applying some statistics to the data that we get. Um, we also know that there's still some challenges based on the previous GPU work around data transfer from the GPU to the CPU. So what we're looking at is offloading some of that analysis to the GPU. Okay, so we have our complex system running and um, we're going to check, you know, the evolution of, of the state. Rather than passing that data back to the CPU, we could just do the analysis on the GPU. So we're developing those tools to do that. And then I guess the other um, aspect is around, we can only fit so much um, data onto the, v the video RAM of the GPU. So we want to be able to distribute across the GPU nodes. Okay, so it's onto something completely different. So this is work that's done by PhD student in collaboration with Karen Meyer. So this is Peter Parner's work. And he's been looking at um, simulating fluids on the GPU. So fluids are used a lot in games. Um, and so Peter was particularly interested in implementing the shallow water equations, um, <coughs> which you can consider a form of the Navier-Stokes um, equations. And the assumption is that the, the vertical scale of the water body is very small compared to the um, horizontal scale. Um, and so then it's it's easier to implement in real time, which is the priority for games, for example. So some of the limitations of the shallow water equations is it's com compute bound. It doesn't really deal with um, fluid interactions. So if you were to drop a, 
a penny or a ball into the water, you wouldn't necessarily get the ripple effects. And um, there hasn't been that much work on coupling some visual effects. So what you won't get with the Navier, with the shallow water equations, is um, foaming or frothing of water or breaking waves. So Peter investigated um, how we could um, create a numerical solver um, for the shallow water equations that would run on the GPU and then look at how we can extend that to deal with water um, or fluid um, interactions with the environment and also visual effects. So I've got a few videos here that show that, if I just set them running. So the first one is we've got some um, bumpy terrain here and we've got the fluid that is inundated so it's flowing over the surface so you can see you've got those wet dry zones the fluid is behaving as expected um, in these um, situations. So Jen, sometimes it's obvious maybe in games when the, the fluid isn't behaving as it should. Um, so what Peter was interested in was creating a physically based model of the fluid simulation and how it interacted with the environment. So you could see how it's flowing around those obstacles and it looks quite um, realistic. Um, on the right hand side there we've got some cubes that are getting dropped into the water and you see that ripple effect. Okay, so it's behaving as, it, as you would expect. Um, and that's quite useful because when you've got that physical based um, behaviour you can hook that into any gameplay mechanics for example. Um, and you might think these are a bit odd models to have in 3D scenes but these are models that people working in graphics use typically. Um, and we just kind of get used to them, I suppose. And so we've got some flow here over a, a, a terrain. So it worked on a quite a large scale um, simulation. So I think that was 1,024 by 1,024. Um, so the next, so once Peter had come up with his solver, he was then interested in adding um, some visual effects. So usually water, um, when you look at a shallow water body, like a swimming pool, for example, you'll see these caustic rays or ripples. And these are basically um, created when you have waves and the light bounces off of them, then you get these sharp refraction patterns um, on the surface. And then we also have these kind of reflections. So these are the things that you would want in a game or a scene, you can get these um, effects if you use ray tracing, for example, but in a real time scene, um, it, you know, you, you have to come up with another way to do it. So this is a, a demonstration where that flat blue water that was in the previous video, um, there is some visual effects. So we've got some foaming here. We've got the reflections of the environment in the, the scene. You've got a bit of the foaming that's caused by these objects, these stones in the water, for example, and we've got reflections. And he does have caustics, but I just couldn't um, find a suitable screenshot in that video to show you. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on to the next part. So that was really about using the GPU for um, computation, simulation. And so the next bit is around games, tech, and AI. Um, so I just wanted for... prosperity to look at this first example. So usually AI in games is A star pathfinding. That's, so this is basically based on Colin Miller's um, lecture notes that he used to give the um, students on the game tech course. So in games, AI pretty much just has to be good enough. And in this example, you just want to get from the start to the end point, avoiding any obstacles. So this was coursework that I got submitted last year that had a really nice UI that I just wanted to share with you. But then to show you also how far AI in games has come. So we've kind of gone from that to this, if it plays. So this is an AI controlled character. So this um, model, human, is walking in the terrain and it's all his movements are dictated by a neural network that's driving the character animation. So it looks quite realistic. I think some of you will see there's a bit of inconsistencies in the arms and in certain parts of the movement. But this is all running in real time um, and it's using deep neural networks. So how it works is 
the neural network's been trained on motion capture data. So there's been um, somebody in a studio that, where there's, they've got basically markers on their body and they um, walk across a number of different obstacles. And that data is then used in a neural network along with the, the gait analysis or the phase of walking to um, predict the movement of the, the character. So this is a player controlled character as well. So you'd have somebody with a console that's actually moving the character around. Um, there's some bits of it that don't look so good. And I think with more training data, it could be improved, such as when he's going downhill. But this just kind of shows the, you know, how far the, the AI has come. So it works with crouching and things like that also. And it works on different terrains. So generally, this type of AI is good when the terrain is flat, but whenever you move or try and train or run the, the AI in a, a different um, system or landscape, then it, it falls over, whereas it seems to be quite adaptive based on the, the data given. And that's probably because the mocap data was very diverse. Yeah, so the character motion is computed on the fly, given the user control via the, the controller and the terrain. So we can use that AI. So if we've got a reasonable model of human movement or behavior, we can then use that to investigate what would happen, you know, crowd movements. So crowd movements are always interesting because after any disaster recovery or any event planning, you want to be able to, to um, simulate crowd movement. So you can see applications there for that type of AI that was originally um, created for games but has broader applications. And the other application that I could see is if you are developing an AI for autonomous cars, okay, so there's two things. You want to test that AI in a rich virtual environment, so another use of games technology. So a lot of game worlds, are, especially racing games, are created in urban environments. So you can use that virtual world, which is rich, to train your AI algorithm the autonomous driving one. But you also want to see how that AI is going to respond to um, human behavior. So pedestrians, for example. So you can use that other AI, the character movement one, um, to test that. Okay, so these are different, I guess, broader applications of that game tech. And that use of the game virtual environment extends to reinforcement learning. So there was, um, <laughs> The Open Gym, which is now called Open AI Gym um, Framework, which allowed um, it was it was for game developers to test new um, reinforcement learning for non-player characters, um, and then these environments have become much more sophisticated. So um, the thing about reinforcement learning is it's the closest thing to how we learn as humans. So you have some kind of rich environment. Um, you, the agent or the AI interacts with that environment through some kind of policy or set of rules and a reward is given. So you don't actually tell the AI what to do, it learns from its interaction with the environment and the reward. So these game environments have been used to test AI and um, the research group um, down in Reading with, with Microsoft have Project Malmo, which is looking at using um, Minecraft worlds to train um, collaborative AI. So they're very much interested in how we can use these rich worlds that have been created for games, but to investigate how AI learn, how do they build teams, how do they collaborate. So that's got loads of applications in, um, in behavioral science, for example. Okay, so now a live feed from the audience. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm going to move to something completely different and talk about another um, technique that has, is moving into games that is actually from the film industry um, but has broader applications. So this is an image from Monster University. I know which character I resonate with there anyway. Um, and what you can see is, well, you probably can't see it so much there because the screen's not brilliant, but Pixar in 2013 used ray tracing in um, 
some of their animation. So what that gives us is some soft shadows. So you could see some of the, sh the soft shadows, oh, I'm pointing to that, sorry, here um, and here. And so ray tracing gives a, another level of realism to the scene. So it's been used in film, um, obviously, for, for decades. Um, but it's not really been used in real time in games because it's computationally intensive. So that, I guess, is true, but um, NVIDIA has, and some other graphics card technology have released um, or have evolved their, their hardware so that we can actually begin to bring some elements of ray tracing in real time to our scenes. So what you're basically seeing up here is a scene that's from a Quake um, game with no lighting and lighting, um, no ray tracing and ray tracing. So what the ray tracing um, scene gives you is these reflections on the water and that kind of foggy effect. In other scenes, it also gave you light shards. Okay, so these were always there, you just weren't, yeah. You, with the ray tracing, the, the um, model of the light um, recovers these reflections. And I guess that's the step towards um, global illumination. So what this, the new GPUs allow us, because of the technology that it's kitted out with, is um, to process some parts of a game or a scene in real time using um, the new ray tracing cards, and they're actually called RTX. So with the recent kind of commodity RTX cards, you've got a bunch of cores, which are kind of compute units for parallel programming. So kind of what we talked about, those other applications for the, the fluid simulation, for um, the microbial um, work. And then what you have in addition, though, is cores dedicated for AI and ray tracing um, capability. So if you want to generate a photorealistic um, scene, then you want to generate a bunch of rays, okay? So that you can accurately model how um, light bounces around the scene, not just those primary rays, but the secondary rays, because it's those that give you these soft shadows and things that I talked about earlier. But it's very expensive computationally, um, and so to do an entire scene in real time, it's possibly not it's not possible. So what we tend to do is just shoot a much smaller number of rays and then what you end up with is a very grainy picture. So this is just like if you take a photo in low lighting conditions, your picture is grainy. And then you apply AI to, to um, sharpen that image or to fill the gaps in, which is what that image on the right does. So a lot of the technology associated with the um, real-time ray tracing, it still isn't really real-time real -time ray tracing, but it's using other techniques to, to fill in the gaps. <clears throat> and so I read an article just last week that the launch of the PlayStation 5, um, it's AMD that are making the graphics cards in the, the um, console, they will also have some ray tracing acceleration so that we can get ever more photorealistic games. Um, and they were interested not just from the audio, not just from the graphics perspective, but also the audio. Um, so rather than um, modeling the bouncing around of um, light rays, you could do the same for sound. Okay. And that might be useful for some applications. So just how can we draw some of that technology into non-game um, applications? So with ray tracing, it would be useful for any type of um, visualization. So this isn't work that we have done, but you've got an image with ray tracing here on the right and one without. And with ray tracing, you get you know, more structure, more detail emerging, which could be useful. Um, for insight and to understand your system. So I'll move to the last section, which is around games technology and visualization. So this pretty much covers some of the work that I've done in the past as well. Um, and so I came up with this framework about how we can use interactive visualization and came up with three different use cases. So the first one is a visual simulation. Um, and that's pretty much where you've got a simulation You've got the output and you just want to render it, okay? And you want to use that to communicate the science, for example. So I refer to that as a visual simulation. It's kind of one-way interaction um, and the, the users are pretty commi committed to the subject matter. So they're experts, essentially. Then there's this notion of a playable system. So you've got two-way interaction. So the, 
the simulation runs through, but you as the viewer or the user can change parameters, which are then model, uh, which are in the model, and then the, the changes are um, affected immediately. And this is generally used by people that have some um, familiarity with the subject domain, or it might be when you're looking at systems like water, energy, food, you might have somebody that really knows the water system, but not the energy and food system. So this would be the playable simulation is a means to um, understand those other interacting facets. And then we've got a game simulation, which is, again, two-way interaction, and it's really there to raise awareness of the subject matter. So I'll talk through a couple of these. So this was some work that we did a while ago, and forgive the retro graphics. So this was um, by PhD student John Isaacs, um, and this was just really to show the, or, or recreate a simulation of a past event. So it was drawing in or using data, um, a bunch of different data, digital elevation model textures, and it was really to highlight um, or re recreate a storm event that happened, I think it was in March sometime, March 31st, and it had significant impact on the West Sands in St Andrews. And it was really to highlight the need for um, coastal um, zone protection in the West Sands. And there's always a bit of resistance to change, so it was, this tool was kind of used to show um, what the potential solutions would be, as, like a soft engineering or a hard engineering solution. So this could definitely do with ray tracing. So we've been working um, with a local company, a manufacturing company, who's interested in the use of um, game technology in specifically um, augmented reality to help them with visualising their manufacturing data in real time. So this um, use case is that you have a supervisor um, that's walking along the factory floor, it's very noisy, um, the, the augmented reality system can, um, via computer vision, can recognise the machine number, then it would load up all of the data associated with the machine, so how many units had uh, been produced, the, another, the health of the machine and other characteristics. So the use of game technology like the HoloLens is really, really interesting when it's um, integrated into the broader data pipelines of organisations and companies. And if you think about um, how that can further be enhanced when we've got really fast, um, super fast broadband like 5G, then um, you know that movement of data in real time is not going to be a problem. And not just data, but maybe um, videos and things like that. So I'm going to skip over a couple because I've underestimated time and move on to the last kind of set of visualisations which were around sustainability and nexus approaches. Now I'd say these are probably the, the most difficult um, areas to unpack and can really benefit from the use of game technology. So sustainable, sustainability and nexus are kind of intangible concepts but um, bouted around quite a lot. So the problems, I guess, or the key characteristics is that there's many competing constraints to satisfy. There's a bunch of different stakeholders. You've got lots of different data that, you, that should be um, used in the, the modelling or the um, intervention adopted. There's no single solution and also you're dealing with an uncertain future. So you might have a intervention that works well now, but actually how is it going to operate in the future? So some of the work that we did around that was um, urban planning. So that was looking at um, some of the different um, urban plans associated with the Dundee waterfront and actually um, overlaying um, sustainability information onto that. And then another one was one that we've just finished with um, EPSRC, which is around... Fertilizer. <coughs> 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 
acts of farming. But crops grown specifically for this purpose need water and land. So while there are innovations that exist today that, if adopted more widely, could adapt and transform systems with benefits for multiple sectors, every innovation needs to be assessed from different perspectives to avoid harmful consequences. So what? So what we did for this work was really to um, assess and visualise the AD innovation in the context of um, the WEF water energy food system. So we combined agent-based modelling with different interactive visualisations to support um, decision makers to decide which um, AD alternative, AD implementation was the, the best in that um, context, because context is very important for these um, complex systems. So the modelling was informed by a wide range of stakeholders, and I think that's very important when we're working with sustainability or nexus approaches, because the evidence demonstrates that we need the broader perspectives to come up with a solution that is going to fit, and that transdisciplinary dialogue um, also aids the design and the uptake of the intervention. So if we design interventions with the users in mind, there's more likely to use them. So I guess the key point is the power of visualizations that cut across sectoral boundaries um, and widen stakeholder engagement um, and encourage dialogue. So just briefly, some of the visualizations that we created as part of that work package. So this is pretty much a visual simulation. You had the results of the agent-based model that modeled all of the different um, AD implementations. You could use a tool such as this to um, discuss the pros and cons of each different alternative based on that decision maker's priority. Okay, so there's never, with a system like the one at Water Energy Food, there's so many conflicting priorities. Tools and interactive visualizations allow us a means to, to open up a dialogue, to discuss those and to reach a consensus. And then the other um, one was more of a, a playable simulation, but I'm going to skip to the, the next one. So this was created as part of a game jam here at Abertay around water energy food. Um, I think maybe some of the um, students are in the audience that made this. So this is really just to, this was made in four to eight hours. It's got some audio as well. And so I guess this type of um, visualisation or game is there to raise awareness of the complexity and some of the challenges associated with managing the na natural resources. <coughs> so hopefully um, these interactive visualisations show that they could be used for engagement and that's pretty much delivered through um, well-designed playable simulations, drawing on design aesthetics and user experience. They offer an experimental place, so a safe space for play and exploration to ask what if questions. They um, can build skills, so playable simulations may promote systems thinking as they offer open-ended experiences for the players, highlighting cause and effect, much like many games, and observation. So it's not about a single right answer for a lot of these problems that we need to find solutions, but it's just about understanding what the connectivity and the scale of the problem space is. And I think playable systems offer a space to do that. And if games are going, or playable systems are going to be used to develop skills, we want to be able to quantify that somehow. So work that we've been doing with PhD student Nick Panitov and colleagues in um, School of Applied Sciences um, is trying to build that learning into a, a framework where we can actually evidence that um, learning is taking place through some kind of controlled experiments. So a couple of slides to go. I know I'm running out of time. So I just wanted to shout out for a couple of projects that I'm actually associated with. So one is InGame, which is one of the um, HRC Creative Clusters projects. And this was um, fund, it's an 
£80 million investment into creative industries by the government. And one of the projects funded was in-game. And that's really looking at um, increasing the, the scale of the video, Dundee's video games cl cluster. Um, and part of um, my role in this project is looking at the diversification of games technology into um, other areas, so much like what we've heard um, earlier. And just a shout out, because I don't think a lot of people know um, that the games industry is worth more than movies and music combined. And so there's um, a lot of opportunities available through the diversification and exploitation of games, both hardware and software, into new um, areas which can offer significant benefits to society and the economy. And the other area I just want, I guess following on from the diversity theme, to shout out about was Women in Games. So I'm an executive board member of Women in Games, as Liz mentioned. And one of the um, challenges of the games industry is um, gender um, balance and I think that starts with the educational pipeline so we recognise that and are working, women in games are working with industry, the government and universities to, to run initiatives um, to promote um, diversity in the games industry and the educational pipeline that feeds it. So in summary, I know that was probably um, quite a lot of very different things and it was a challenge to pull it together into um, some coherent thread. Um, but I guess the main kind of takeaways is that the reach and impact of games, um, technology and concepts is enormous. I think it's still under um, exploited. So the fourth industrial revolution in terms of AI is founded on GPU. So we've seen how the GPUs have evolved so that we can run um, faster AI solutions. Game tech can offer many benefits in many areas, so better workflows and productivity, so much like the AR example, science communication, supporting planning and service provision across sectors and understanding complex systems. So in my view, the future of game tech for complex systems or playable um, systems will combine all of the things I've kind of talked about, simulation, graphics and AI in the future. Um, I think it's fair to say that there's an increasing number of sectors are recognising the power of games to unravel their complex problems. And with that, I'll end. And I've not got any specific shout outs to individuals, but basically just wanted to thank the institution, um, collaborators, internal, external, past presents, mentors, colleagues, um, students and family. And that is me.